Welcome, everyone, to the Religion Unplugged podcast, your one-stop shop for all the best religious news and culture. I am very happy today to welcome Brian and Kelly Estes. Um, they are the producers behind the new documentary film, God Bless Bitcoin, which is a fascinating topic, so I'm very excited to talk to them. Uh, so first off, just tell us uh, tell us about yourselves and what got you involved in this project. All right, you want to ladies go first? first? Oh, ladies first, okay. So um, Brian actually brought me into this project because of what I do for a living. So I've been in education for the last 30 years of my life. I've been an English teacher. And then for the last 15, I've worked with students who live at the poverty level to help break the cycle of poverty through education. And I've done that primarily as a writing teacher. I have my master's degree in the teaching of writing. And so one of my skills is that I'm good at pulling a story from somebody. And Brian had all of these thoughts in his head about a movie that he thought he needed to make. He felt like he was being called to make it, but he is a math person. He's in finance and um, he doesn't tell stories well. So he tapped me to say, hey, I really feel called to do this. Would you help me? And of course I said, yes. And two years later, we're sitting here talking to you. <laughs> Yeah, my, my background is I was in traditional finance for over 20 years as an asset manager. And then about 10 years ago, I learned about Bitcoin and blockchain technology and decided to devote all my future efforts to that. So I've been building, um, you know, and financing and mentoring uh, Bitcoin and blockchain companies for the last 10 years. And so I read a book four years ago called Thank God for Bitcoin, which is the Christian view about a sound monetary system and how Bitcoin works within that and it just made me curious about what do the other religions say and so i went on this journey to look at you know what you know the jewish and the buddhist and muslim and hindu religions say about monetary systems and money and bitcoin and you know and that's that's where the curiosity started and then um you know i, I kind of dropped it and then you know for about two years i had this internal voice saying you need to tell this story about what you learned. And I don't know how to, like Kelly said, I'm not a very good storyteller. You know, I've never written a book or, you know, made a movie before. And, you know, the voice just kept get, getting louder and louder. And finally I went to Kelly and I asked her for her help. And so what the movie is, is, you know, it's what was in my head and in my heart and now it's on film. And so, you know, that's, you know, it's the story that was inside me. And I would say yes. both of us are extremely bothered by the fact that none of our schools, both public or private, teach financial literacy to their students. And so most people are just out there blind about how to save, how to invest, how to plan for their future. They don't know how their money works. And so it was important for us to explain how our current system is working. And I think that helps people really understand why they're feeling the pressure of not being able to um, afford the life that they would like. So I think that was something that drove both of us yeah. to want to make this movie. Yes. So the, this is, it's really interesting. The movie's really interesting. The movie is about, obviously, for those who have not seen it, it is explaining, you know, why, what Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is and why it's something that people should support, particularly, you know, looking at religious people and why it's important that cryptocurrency and particularly Bitcoin helps to bring about things that religious people like, like, you know, they like people getting out of poverty. They like, you know, su supporting families and they like, you know, being able to protect from uh, the, uh, uh, the marginalized from the oppressed potentially. So could you explain again for, but it is, I will say this, it is a very weird thing. Like you don't really put in most people's minds, you know, very strongly religious people and, Bitcoin. First of all, most people don't know what cryptocurrency is. And to the degree that they do, it is in their minds this weird thing that like nerds and libertarians are into and the kind of, you know, finance, you know, 20 year olds on YouTube and and Twitter. So if you could, for people who have not watched the documentary um, and don't know about it, briefly explain what cryptocurrency is and why you were passionate about saying, hey, this is something that religious people 
uh, specifically should care about. Okay, so as a nerd and a libertarian, <laughs> I'll be glad to answer that question. Um, so all Bitcoin is the software. So it's open source internet protocol software. And I know those are a lot of words strung together, but open source internet protocol software is, we use that every day. So when you get on the internet, you're using what's called HTTP, that's hypertext transfer protocol. That's open source internet protocol software. When you send an email, you're using what's called SMTP, simple mail transfer protocol. That's all Bitcoin is. It's open source protocol, just like email and just like the internet is, except it allows us to move our money and our value through the internet without having permission. Just like you send an email, you don't need anyone's permission to send data to someone. And now we have this open source system to send value through the internet and the government and banks and you know we don't need their permission. So we do peer to peer transactions, which are basically free and we don't have to pay $2 trillion to the banks and to Visa and MasterCard and PayPal for moving our money around. And that $2 trillion, that's what we pay. We as humans, we pay $2 trillion a year in money processing fees. And those fees are going to zero, just like long distance phone call um, went to zero. You know, we used to all pay long distance phone call bills. We don't pay them anymore because we have a piece of software called Voice Over Internet Protocol, VOIP. And that's all Bitcoin is. It's money over internet protocol. And it allows us to freely move our money around the world for free. And the banks don't like that and the governments don't like that um, because it gets them, you know, it, it takes the control away from them and gives it back to the people. Yeah, so the argument that you make is of course right now we have money that basically we need the intermediaries of government and banks in order to to make transactions with each other to make trades with each other and you need you know the government because the government is actually the one who controls the money and prints the one money and you know points a gun at you and says this is the money you're going to use um and then the banks are the intermediaries we have to go through the banks in order to make those transactions and so your argument is on the First of all, that if, you know, problem with the government doing it is that they print so much money causes inflation, which, you know, causes us to lose the money that we've actually earned and saved, which is a kind of theft against, you know, people who've worked for that money. Um, but then also it's just, hey, not having, you know, le having having less control, uh, having, uh, you know, the government say, hey, you know, like you give examples of places, governments around the world where people say, hey, we don't like your political protest. So we're just going to not let you use your money. And so why is it something that um, so that's like an argument you make that then on Bitcoin is like, OK, this is purely, you know, peer to peer. This is not using intermediaries and it's not going to get inflated. Um I think that for a lot of people, they look at the internet and say, okay, well, that makes sense. I use a lot of my transactions over the internet. But, you know, and I, I don't mind the idea of saying, okay, maybe I have the internet plus, you know, other money, you know, but they also know that there's ways in which the internet is not entirely secure either. You know, there's a lot of people who are, for example, buying physical books because they know that, wait, the book online might, somebody else might be able to change it you know, without me knowing or without my permission. So everybody's got their fingers in the pot. There is an idea that, okay, something that's a physical space that exists in a physical space elsewhere might be more secure than something of Bitcoin. So why is it that uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency is more secure than something that, you know, for lack of a better, even though the government does have a gun that it points to make you do what it is, that is still a real gun that can, you know, create some uh, stability. Or maybe if you want something more secure, you do gold. So why is it that there's more security in an online transaction? Yeah, so there's two reasons. So Bitcoin is a network. So the more people that use the network, the more powerful and more secure it is. And so when you look at, when you drill down into the Bitcoin network, it's the largest computer network in the world by far. And so it has, you know, I, I don't want to get too technical, but what you look at is what's called the hash rate or the computational power of the network. 
And the Bitcoin network is 100 times larger than the Google network is. And it's, it's the biggest network in the world. It's the most powerful computer network in the world. So, and that's what provides the security behind the network. The Bitcoin software, it's been around for 15 years. It's never been hacked in 15 years. And since 2014, it's been up and running 100% of the time. And over the last 15 years, it's been up and running 99.98% of the time. You know, the first five years, it had, you know, it was down a little bit. But the last 10 years, it's never gone down. So it, it's, it, like I said, it's the most secure network in the world. And that's what protects our money. That's what protects the value inside of the system. So yeah. if, I, if I can, you know, translate, yeah. if I to make sure I'm understanding it correctly, it's one thing. It's so secure because, sure, you know, five people or maybe 100 people might try to manipulate it. But because there's so many people who are a part of the network, it's impossible for it to, for everybody to be compromised. And so therefore it's, or even the majority of people to be compromised and they're invested in the system of it being secure. And so that's what adds the security. Is that a, a good way to interpret what you're saying? It is. And the reasons behind that is a new block of Bitcoin transactions get printed to the blockchain every 10 minutes. And so you have to actually break into that block within 10 minutes. And there's just not enough computing capacity in the world to do that. And even if you broke into that one block, all the previous blocks, all the 850,000 previous blocks, you can't get, you can't break those, you know, within 10 minutes. So that's what creates the foundation and why it's so secure. So one of the things I love best about your documentary is that it is so American because most of the rest of the world doesn't have the same friendship or partnership between religious conservatives and economic libertarians that America does. In most places, um, religious conservatives, they're interested in obeying what God has said, what they believe God has said, and having society conform to the right way and wrong way to behave. And they you know, want to you know, enforce that socially or through the government. And they also don't want things to change because, you know, they're invested in this faith that has stayed the same for thousands of years. Whereas you have the economic libertarians and entrepreneurs who are all into experimentation and uh, expanding human freedom. But in America, you have this friendship between these two sides that really are not on the same side in most places. So I have two questions for you. One, why do you think that's a unique thing in America and that's not so true of the rest of the world if it is so, if they go so hand in hand the way you talk about in the documentary? And why do you make the case that religious people should, you know, go hand in hand with this kind of free market and uh, experimental thing of cryptocurrency? So I don't know why I think it is different in America, which just proves how American I am. I only know what I know. And I can't tell you how many times we were making this film and and we want it to be universal. Um, We're dubbing it in um, seven languages and subtitling it in over 15 so that everybody can understand it in their language. But at our core, we understand that we are a very American centric way. Of, we have a very American-centric way of looking at things. But what we thought brought religion into Bitcoin and really money in general was we were trying to explore money through the moral and ethical lens. And what better place to find the base layer of morals and ethics than the world's religions? It is in the Bible. It is in the Torah and the Quran where God tells his people how they are to live, how they are to treat each other morally and ethically. And money is one of the hottest topics in the Old Testament. It looks like humans have had a hard time with money since the beginning, (laughs) and so we still are. And it's not so much that we think Bitcoin is for religious people or non-religious people. We think it is a money that when you look at it through the sacred scriptures, makes more sense morally and ethically. It's a money that doesn't allow anyone to steal our time and our talents 
and our energy from us through money printing. It is a money that prevents governments from waging unjust wars. If you cannot print more money, you cannot pay for those wars, and you have to ask your citizens to either buy into the war or, you know, through issuing more bonds the way they used to, or you have to dig into your own reserves to wage the war. Well, Bitcoin doesn't allow you to print money to be able to do that. So those are just two examples of ways that Bitcoin is able to answer to some of the moral dictates of the sacred scriptures, whether it's, you know, Christianity, Judaism, whatever. So I would say that it's really, it's a a lens more than anything else that we were looking at it through. Anything to add, uh, uh, sir? Because I know that you wrote you wrote the books, like you know, thank God for Bitcoin. So, and you were the, you know, no, big, I read the book. Yeah. Read oh, you that. read the book. Yeah. Read the book. Yeah. No, okay, so don't take away from that. Yeah. We're not no, 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 no. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, there were six authors of that book, and like I said, it's the Christian only view. Um, so, you know, we look at you know the other religious views. You know, one of them that's common through the Old Testament is. Um, you know, in Ezekiel, it says that, you know, you shouldn't expropriate money from your people to conduct violence and destruction. And that's a point that we make in the, in the movie. That's all really interesting. I really encourage people to check out the uh, documentary if they're interested in this topic, because it definitely does. I will say this is what, again, one of the things I really like about the documentary is it does make it very simple and clear to actually get a basic understanding of it, regardless of where you fall down on the issue, at least helps break down these ideas in a way that's understandable to talk about. What would you like people to come away with if you could have your way when they finish watching this? I mean, I think it's just, it's exactly like you said. It explains what Bitcoin is in simple to understand terms so that it doesn't seem so strange to people or like that, you know, funny money, that internet funny money that a lot of people think it is. So we kind of like to think of this as just a springboard. We've opened the door to understanding and we're hoping that it inspires you to go out and learn more on your own to see if Bitcoin might actually be something that would be helpful for you you to be able to save for yourself and your family in the future. So really it is just the first step in a Bitcoin journey is what we're hoping for. Yeah, and what I'm hoping for is that there are people that are working more and more hours and a lot of people have taken second jobs Mm -hmm. and they they still can't keep up with their bills and they don't understand like what's wrong. They, you know, they're doing everything that they're supposed to do and they're still struggling financially. And so the first 20 minutes of the movie, we explain in plain language how the monetary system works and then you now you know, understand why you're working more and more hours. And the simple reason is that the government prints more money and it dilutes your purchasing power. And so the dollars that you earn today, if you just keep them in dollars, they don't buy as much in the future. And so, for example, six years ago, if you had $1,000 in your checking account, it only buys $520 worth of goods and services today because the government diluted you. You got they, you know, they printed more money. And so there's you can opt out of that system. You don't have to stay in that system. You do have a choice. And that's what we I, we want people to come away with is that, you know, the system that you're in, it's you know, it's an option. You're you're choosing to be in it. And you could opt out of it, opt out of it if you want to. And there is, you know, in my opinion, there's a better system out there. Okay, so actually, I lied. There is one more question I'd like to ask before okay. I can launch people into uh, where they can find the movie and such. The first is one of the things I really like about you know libertarians and uh, the, you know free market people is they're not utopian in their thinking. They understand that everything is like trade offs, and so I'm wondering. What would you say are the potential downsides or dangers of cryptocurrency that if we are going to kind of move towards adopting that as a model that we should be wary about in order to be responsible with it? Yeah, I will speak in just very plain everyday terms, something that I think isn't a downside to it, but that I do think is is a hard lesson for people. 
right now our money, you know, it, it doesn't hold our power. And so we've become a very consumerism based society. We all, you know, there's fast fashion, there's fast food, everything's cheap, it's easy and it's in abundance. And so we train ourselves that, you know, every year we're going to go get a new coat or we're going to get new shoes every month or whatever it is, or we're just going to go out to dinner because we don't need to save money if it's not going to hold its value. So the way our money system works now is it incentivizes us not to save. But when you have something like Bitcoin that holds its value, you certainly don't want to sell it to go buy a pair of shoes on sale when you've got a perfectly good pair of shoes at home. And so I think that that's going to be a hard adjustment for most Americans. I don't think this is around the world, but I do think as Americans, um, we have become a society that values things over time. But Bitcoin now teaches us, again, what it used to be like, which is you save this money, let it sit there. You don't need to buy every little thing that's out you're out there. You don't have to have the newest thing. And so for that, I think that's hard to learn, but being able to deny yourself and um, delay gratification is, is an important life skill that I think Bitcoin encourages. Yeah, and I'll talk to the financial side of it. Um, Bitcoin is very volatile in price. Um, so the reason it's volatile is because the world's trying to figure out what this technology is worth. And some people say it's worth zero. And there are other people out there like me who think it's priceless. And so as we figure out what is it worth, then the price goes up and down. So my recommendation to people is don't put money into, don't put dollars into Bitcoin that you can't afford to lose. Um, but you don't want to trade it either. It's not a trading vehicle. It's a savings vehicle. You know, use it as a savings account for the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years. Or if you want to pass it along to your grandkids or your great grandkids, it's a way to, you know, take the dollars that you earn today, the excess dollars that you earn today and store them for future purchases in the, you know, in, in the future. So, you know, so, but during that time frame over the next one year, five years, 10 years, the price is very volatile. So you don't want to, like I said, trade it. You just kind of like buy and hold it and use it as a long-term savings vehicle. Very cool. So if people, A, want to see your film, how do they do that? And B, if they wanted to get started on a cryptocurrency journey, where would you recommend they get started? Well, you can go to our website, godblessbitcoin.com, and the movie is there free, not only to watch, but to download. So if you wanted to host a viewing party, it is there for you. We open sourced it so that we could get our goal of 1 billion views. We'd love as many people as possible to understand that Bitcoin is hope. So it is there for free. It's on YouTube for free. So that's how you can watch it. And then... Um, I'll let Brian talk to the rest. Yeah, you could also go to um, YouTube and just search for God Bless Bitcoin. Um, like Kelly mentioned earlier, um, it's you know we're dubbing it in seven different languages, so which encompasses eighty five percent of the spoken language in the world. Um, and you know we just hope people watch it and you know it sets them on their journey of learning. And um, you know it, it, one thing that um, I just learned yesterday, the most frequent phrase in the Bible, um, it's repeated 70 times in the Bible, is don't be afraid. And um, so my, my suggestion is don't be afraid to learn something new. And if, if you spend the 89 minutes, um, you're going to learn something new. And we hope that people, you know, once they learn that, they you know, help spread the word and, you know, educate other people about this technology. And there's another great website called hope.com that has a ton of free resources to help you in that Bitcoin journey like you asked. So they have everything from articles to podcasts to links to free classes. Everything on the website is free. So there, there's no reason for you to, you know, not take them up on it. But it's hope.com. And that can help everybody of all levels understand a little bit more about Bitcoin. 
Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, listeners, watchers, uh, for joining us. Uh, this is the Religion Unplugged podcast, your one-stop shop for all the best religious news and culture.